our history this uh, presentation is on America 1900 to 1930 um, it actually goes a little beyond 1930 uh, but America's kind of trajectory is a little differently. It's heavily influenced by European art, but it um, because the wars don't happen in the U.S., there's um, less kind of defined periods. America has become a, a growing world power during this time. Um, if you think about the concept of um, in 1900 to you know 1912, that's the kind of period of imperialism in America. Um, as well as a kind of new international um, respect kind of given. Um, there's also industrialization and commercialization at fuel force, should be say full force, but it was fueled. So I'll keep it. Um, more individual voices are celebrated. There's less schools of art. Um, there's more American individualism. So you can find kind of traces of people kind of working with each other. Um, but it's not necessarily kind of what was happening in Europe where people had like, you know, Blue Rider and um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there was um, kind of, we must, we must give credit to Alfred Stieglitz who helped cultivate a modern art scene. Um, he was a German immigrant who created a gallery in New York City. Um, and he would show, he was a photographer, but he would also show a lot of other artists who then became famous. So um, much credit to him and the New York City Armory show. So at the Armory, there was this very large show about um, art, um, current art, but part of it was also European art. So a lot of um, the Fauves and the Cubists and whatnot were showing at this, and so a lot of American artists saw it and took it in new directions. So before um, kind of the turn of the uh, uh, 1900s, we have the Ashcan School, which always reminds me a little bit of Impressionism. You can kind of see this like kind of um, unfinishedness about it and this kind of in the fly of the moment that's very Impressionism. But it's looking at kind of the social realism of the cities, um, of urbanity. Um, often there's, um, they have a very kind of darker feel to them than you would have seen in the Impressionists. Um, sometimes they're not a celebration. Sometimes they are a celebration of American modernity. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But we have a big change that happens when the Armory Show comes. So it was February 17th to March 15th. Um, it was in New York's 69th Regiment Armory, which is kind of the, the kind of uh, temporary barracks um, that um, can be opened up for sort of like a convention center. Think about it that way. Um, introduced Americans to modern art that moved beyond realism. Okay, so this is a slight attack that was done um, on it, uh, looking at kind of everything becoming cubist, which is kind of humorous. Um, there, um, Marcel Duchamp, who you might remember from the Dadaists, um, he, his, um, new Descending the Staircase was shown and people got really excited about it. Uh, Duchamp's kind of interesting because he like experimented with a lot of different styles. He shows how an artist can establish themselves with realistic art, but then they could try on cubism. He could try on Dada. Um, and he actually continues to try on a lot of different styles as he goes on. And he was an experimenter. He wanted to see what he could do with art, which was kind of cool. Cause I think so many people think that you have to like have one style. Um, uh, Dali was the same. Dali changed his style over time as well. And people often don't know that. So um, it's a good lesson to see that Duchamp could do lots of different things, but you see that it's not just that it's cubist. He is showing action and motion in ways that uh, Picasso did not. So you have this figure moving down a, a staircase um, so quickly, and it actually reminds me of this like blend of futurism with um, cubism. Um, so other uh, artists that uh, really should be kind of uh, looked at is one is Arthur Dove. Arthur Dove abstracted nature. Um, and you can always spot an Arthur Dove because um, he takes kind of a singular palette usually. Um, sometimes he does like a, a punch of color, but it's, it's usually very natural uh, kind of palette. And um, he, he looks at like the very kind of breakdown of form of nature and piles it all together almost as if it was a collage. Um, they are also kind of very smooth in strokes. Um, Arthur Dove was and did uh, friends with Georgia O'Keeffe and did know her. So they 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 do they um, probably are the closest to each other um, in the American kind of scene. Uh, but they're different. They're very different um, in the way that kind of he sort of collects different shapes and puts them together. She goes into flowers and looks at them more specifically. So we'll look at that in a second. 
Here is um, Alfred Stieglitz's The Steerage. Um, it's one of the most famous photographs in history. It's um, from him. He's above. Um, you can see here that he's on par with the people up here. And all of the people up here, the, the middle class, upper class, is looking down on the, upon the poor in a ship going to America. Um, so he was fascinated by the class situation. The scene fascinated, fascinated me. I was away from the mob called Rich. It would be a picture based on related shapes and deepest human feeling, a step into my own evolution, a spontaneous discovery. So he took this picture. Now, it makes it sound like it's a spontaneous discovery, but look right here on this picture. Um, he knows his lines. He knows to pull the eye in, to look at the rich who are looking down on the poor, who are just trying to survive on this ship in the kind of not as great um, conditions. So, um, you know, this was kind of one of those uh, moments that people in mankind don't really look at themselves very clearly, but this picture shows it back as, you know, these, these extremes that were happening in America during this time, particularly with immigrants. Stieglitz was famously married to Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, and some of the first kind of traces of George O'Keeffe we have are actually his photography of her. Um, they um, were married um, until Stieglitz's death, but they did live apart for periods of time. He was quite obsessed with her hands. So we have endless photographs of her face as well as her hands. Um, and he kind of would take pictures of her in different uh, poses and stuff like that. They had one of these like kind of art um art love affairs where they um, admired each other's work and he kind of um, gave her a studio. He showed a lot of her art. There, uh, he had tons of nudes of her photography. Um, they were very intellectually minded together. Um, they did have a complicated uh, marriage. So we'll talk about that when we get to her a little bit. Um, but um, he, she and he, he, when he met her, she was pretty young and that kind of like started her career into kind of um, being a celebrated artist. Another photographer, American photographer, that should be kind of mentioned at this point is Edward Weston. Um, he did a lot of nudes, but he did them as landscapes. Um, so if you look here, this is a nude, but um, he also has ones of um, dunes. Um, he also has ones of like, um, I'll show you in a second, of pepper and things. He, he really kind of took the, takes the basic form of something and really tries to... Um, use light to highlight that basic kind of form. And um, he uh, takes it into pieces so that you can um, sort of imagine um, the parts of the whole. Now, this being a woman makes it kind of problematic because um, she is the base of her body um, in that way that um, a lot of art historians would now kind of analyze kind of the male gaze without her ability to look back at you. Um, she's been cut into body parts. But it was a part of a general larger project. So here's his pepper where he's like this distorted pepper. He's trying to like highlight the beauty. You know, some people really struggle with this picture and either think it's, they can see kind of the, like the curves and kind of the highlights of the light. Whereas other people really struggle with just the shape of the pepper, which is a fascinating psychological experiment. Um, here's Man Ray, um, who, um, was, uh, uh, French, but moved to America. So he's sort of kind of this um, bridge between um, uh, two um, continents that ends up happening because of the war-torn period. So um, one of the reasons why American art improves actually has to do with a lot of the artists fleeing Europe. Um, he also did this very famous Le Violon de Ung. So he's taking like the kind of odalesque shape, and he's adding um, violin strats. He was very heavily, you can notice, influenced by many ready-made Dada. Um, you know, he was part of the Dada scene for a period, um, and then takes it another kind of um, step, and he sort of like adds to different things. So, um, and you can see that there's this orientalist kind of um, having to do with kind of her um, hair co head coverings, as well as um, the fabric that's draped around her um, body. Those are all very kind of orientalist fabrics. And so he's sort of doing a nod to the previous artist, but adding um, frets so she can be played like a violin. Stuart Davis um, it was influenced by the Jazz Age. Um, he, this is called Lucky Strike. 
Um, people would kind of talk to him about the fact that he was Cubist, but he wasn't. He didn't really consider himself a Cubist. He considered himself someone to be influenced by jazz. Um, he says, I don't, want to, I don't want people to copy Matisse and Picasso, although it is entirely proper to admit their influence. I don't want, I don't make things, excuse me, I don't make paintings like theirs. I make paintings like mine. Stuart Davis, he said that in 1940. This is another one of his. Jazz music has always been very important to me from the time I was little boy. As soon as I was old enough to go around to places where they played it, well, I went there. It's been a continuous source of inspiration in my work from the very beginning for the simple reason that I regard it as one of the Amer one American art up into now, which seems to be me to have the same quality of art without ulterior motive that I found in modern European. And so he listens to jazz, responds to jazz, and um, it's uh, most of his stuff is improvised like jazz. So he'll sort of start with, he actually starts with one scene and then he sort of paints on top of it and top of it until he abstracts it more. And so we've actually like x-rayed the layers of his paintings and you can see underneath it that he has kind of recreated a bunch of different times. And so he takes um, a form that everyone recognizes and he chops it up and puts it into a new form um, and, um, and, and, and how he's feeling in the moment so much like jazz. Um, here's examples. We know that he took this landscape here and then he sort of kind of figured out ways to keep it on the plane that he wanted it on, um, but then to change it um, even more. So it's kind of a very cool artist who's sort of like generally lesser known um, and kind of reveals a lot. So as I see the artist as a cool spectator, a reporter at an arena of hot events. Another artist is Aaron Douglas um, from Slavery Through Reconstruction. Um, this is an oil and canvas. It is a, a mural size, so it's five feet by 11 uh, uh, feet and seven inches, so almost 12 feet. And if you start here on the left, you see this mural scene starting with kind of um, sort of the cotton fields and the clan um, and um, people working, but then pointing to the, to, uh, the capital and to industry. Um, and there's soldiers back here fighting in war. So these are all the things, kind of the, the shifts and changes for African-Americans. Here's a nod to jazz. Um, there is some elements that you can see of uh, modernism and the breaking down of form, um, but it's also a narrative. So this is something that you could compare to the Bayou Tapestry and sort of kind of the plight of African-American in America. Um, and it's, it's part of a series. So this was done in 1934. Another um, artist during this period was Charles DeMuth, um, and he calls it, this is called My Egypt. So this is a, um, a grain silo, um, and it's made into this quite beautiful um, there's light coming down on it. And My Egypt, this is his pyramids. These are kind of the, um, the um, great creations of America um, and um, its ingenuity, ingenuity and <laughs> industry. And then here we have, we'll end with George O'Keefe. So um, George O'Keefe um, lived a very long time, actually, I think close to 100 years. Um, and she started at the Art Institute of Chicago and then started um, showing in uh, New York as part of the Students League, and she got to know Stieglitz. Um, she uh, started in the city, so mo her early work was largely the cityscapes like here. I actually, when I was 10 or... I can't remember how old I was, seven. I went and saw the the famous George O'Keefe retrospective in the National Gallery, which was the first time she was ever shown at a major museum. And I went home and I got this painting and put it hung on my wall. And that's probably where my art history story started. Um, and she, her early stuff was when she lived in New York with Stieglitz, but she eventually uh, moves out west. Um, and this is also when they were still married but living separately. So he had some affairs with some women, and George O'Keefe also had affairs with women. So she very famously, she uh, was bisexual. She would not talk about it in public. It is also one of the reasons why she did not talk about necessarily her um, flowers in public. Uh, she would not confirm things. One of the things to look at is that she takes a basic form and looks at its abstraction. So she kind of looks at the smooth beauty of the shell, but you're really just focusing on the, um, the movement of it. Her um, Jack in the Pulpit series is one of the most famous. She starts on the outside of a flower and then slowly moves in and in and in. It's actually at the National Gallery, and they show almost all parts of it um, pretty frequently. Um, but you can see the smooth kind of rendering of the folds of the flower. 
Um, so that is something she's well known for, and she is often kind of controversy because she would not confirm what it was. 